Open up a brand new Flutter project and delete everything below it and we're going to create this game completely from scratch. So let's do our usual setting up. I'm going to create a new homepage.dart file and inside here is where we're going to create the scaffold. So this scaffold should just be a blank app and the color, I want to make the theme of this game to be purple. So let's do deep purple 100 and in the middle we're going to use a stack. So I've used a stack in all of my other games so that we can position different elements on the screen. And the first thing I'm gonna make is a ball. So just a basic container with a height and width of 15. And let's place it in the middle. Now this is a square currently, so let's change it into a, uh, into a circle. Now the first thing to do is I wanna move this ball around. So I wanna create a double and we'll actually create two variables. So X and a Y coordinate. Now let's wrap our scaffold in a gesture detector so that when the user taps the screen, we can trigger this method called start game. And in the start game, what I want to do is I want to use a timer as I have used many times. And with a timer, the duration, let's say 10 milliseconds and inside, what we're going to do is update the ball position and subtract 0.01. So that means it's going to go upwards as you just saw just then. Now let's write some text to invite the user to tap the screen. So I want to have a tap to play container and let's put some text that just says tap to play. And I'm going to position this at negative 0.2, making it slightly above the ball. And of course, let's encapsulate this code into a new file, which I'll call cover screen. And let's go back here and paste the code into the file. Now, one thing that we'll need to keep track of is if the game has started or not. So if the game hasn't started, then we'll display tap to play. But if the game has started, then we'll display a container that has nothing in it. So we're gonna to have to create this variable. So this is gonna be a Boolean since it's gonna be a true or false. And when we hit start game, then that's when the Boolean has game started is gonna be equal to true, in which case it's gonna be passed onto the cover screen and then no longer display tap to play. Now, just like we did with the cover screen, let's encapsulate the ball code as well. So I'm going to create a new file, ball.dart. Let's call it my ball and just copy that ball code in into this file and make sure to make those constructors. So the X and the Y intercept for the ball. Then we can just import my ball and make sure to again pass through the X and Y coordinates. Now let's create some other objects as well. So let's create the player. So player.dart and calling it my player, what we're going to do is we're going to have a little brick. So we need to control the X coordinate and for the alignment. So the X coordinate is, is going to be what we control and for the Y coordinate, I leave it at 0 0.9. So one is at the bottom, meaning 0 0.9 is towards the bottom and the height of the container will just make it a thin height of 10. And for the width, we also want to decide in the home page what the width is going to be. Now, the reason why it's out of two is because the way the alignment works is from negative one to positive one. So that's a distance of two. So two representing the entire width of the screen, we can decide, all right, player width could be like 0 0.5 or 0 0.2. And we don't currently have these variables. So let's just create them real quick. So the X coordinate as well as the player width. So we'll just say 0 0.3 for now. And let's see how that looks. Cool, so it looks like it's that width. One thing I like to do is always use the clip R rect, which just makes the corners a bit round, makes it look a touch nicer. Now, what else should we do? So let's try to control the player now. For this, I'm gonna actually use the physical keyboard. So that's the input method I'm gonna use for this particular game. And I use this in some of my other videos. So raw keyboard listener. And what we're going to do is for the on key, we're just going to check for two keys. So if it's the left arrow key, then uh, we'll move left. If it's the right arrow key, then we will move, uh, move right. So we haven't really created these methods yet. So we'll just write them in for now. You can see the red squiggles and let's just come up to the methods and create them real quick. 
So we have one moving left and then one moving right. So moving left and right, again, pretty easy. We can just say, all right, the X coordinate, let's increment down 0 0.2. And for the moving right, we'll add 0 0.2. 0 0.2 is an arbitrary number that I just chose. Obviously, the higher the number, the bigger jumps you're going to move. So it looks like we can move fine, but if we go off the edge, then yeah, we're just going to go off the screen. So we're going to have to prevent this from happening. So let's come to our functions here and let's put a simple if statement. And basically what I'm going to do is we're only going to allow it to move left if moving left means that we're not going off the screen. So yeah, this is just some simple code to do that. And let's copy it and do the same thing for moving right. Just make sure to change all the signs around. And now hopefully it's going to prevent it from going off the screen. Now the next thing I'm going to do is just change the direction of the ball to come downwards. It's going a bit too fast. Let's make that smaller. And one thing I want to show is where is player X exactly? So player X is the X coordinate of our brick at the bottom. But an X coordinate is only one particular position. Like it's only one spot. So if we have a rectangle, like on the bottom of the brick, where is the X coordinate in relation to this brick? And just to illustrate the point I'm trying to make, I just created another container that has a very thin width, and this will help us locate exactly where player X is. And so you can see there that it's in the middle of the, of the brick, and that's because we set player X initially to be zero, which is in the middle of the screen. But as we move to the left, you can see the position of the red, of the red line uh, changing, like it's no longer in the center of the brick. And so you can see as I move left and right, the position of the red line changes in accordance to this alignment. Now this poses a challenge for us because we want a way to know if the ball has hit the brick or if it has missed the brick. And as I mentioned before, a brick has a width to it. So one X coordinate is not enough to really check if you're hitting the brick or not. Um, and the secondary challenge is, is the fact that this red line, the X coordinate is always moving, like it's not always in the middle. So how do we go around this problem? Well, what I really would like is for the red line to, for example, just be on the left hand side of the brick. So I did a bit of math behind the scenes and just did a bit of algebra to figure out uh, an equation that basically converts the X coordinate to the X coordinate that we're after basically. So with a given X coordinate, we can say, 2 times player x plus player width divided by 2 minus player width. So this is something that we just made. And now you can see that the red line, it's exactly on the edge. And this is really helpful for us to be able to know if the ball is going to hit the brick or not. Well, it looks like the right moving right function is still not working properly. Let's just adjust this a little bit. And just to show you again one last time the importance of what we just did. Uh, if I put another container in, let's make it green this time. And I say player X, which is that red line, plus the width of the brick. Then now you can see that there's the red line and the green line on the edges of the brick. So all of that is just to show you. So I don't really actually want those bricks there. But what I do know is those X coordinates. So next thing is let's have a sense of direction because once the ball touches our brick, it's going to have to change the direction to go back upwards. So let's give it a variable called ball direction. And at the beginning, we'll just set it to be down. And so when we're calling the move ball method in our timer, if the direction is currently down, then we're going to move down. And if the direction is currently up, then we're going to subtract to make us move upwards. Now, the other thing we need to do is to also constantly update the direction. So move ball just checks what the current direction is and moves according to it. Uh, update direction, we need to constantly check if we are hitting off different objects. So uh, let's have a couple if statements. So the first one is if the ball Y is greater than 0 0.9, which is the Y coordinate of the brick, then change the 
then change the directions. So if we're hitting the top and the bottom of the screen, then we're going to flip flop the direction. Cool, you can see now it works. Now obviously that's not exactly what we want because we want it to be able to control the brick. Uh, we want it to be able to bounce off the brick. So let's try to keep doing, let's try to keep making progress. So we're not only going to bounce off if the ball Y coordinate is greater than 0 0.9, but we also need to check the X coordinates. So this is where our earlier math comes in handy. So we're going to check ball X, right hand side of the player X. And it's also on the left hand side of the player X plus the width. So that that's the red and green lines that I showed you earlier. So make sure the ball is between those two. And cool, you can see if we move out of the way, because we put this code in, the ball is going to just continue going downwards. But if I leave the platform and our inequalities have been satisfied, then it's going to bounce off. Okay, so now let's continually add to this game. So the next thing is to check if the game is over. So in other words, to check if the player has died. Because if it has, then we can cancel the timer and stop this ball from moving. This calls for a boolean that we'll just keep track of. And for the is player dead, we're going to return false uh, as default. And if the ball y happens to be greater than one, then we're going to return true. So one is the very bottom of the screen. So if you're going to move, if you're going to move past that, then the player has died. In which case, the timer has stopped. As you can see, the ball just stops right there. Now let's create a new file called game over screen so that we can display some text at the end. And for the alignment, just X will have a zero in the middle and just minus 0 0.3 to raise it a little bit. And we're going to need to know that variable from before. So if the game is over, then we can display this screen. And what we're going to display is just some text that says game over. So if the game is over, then, then show game over screen. And if it's not the case, then just show a blank container. So let's come over here and put it into our stack. Hey, there we go. So once we died, we show a little game over screen. Now let's just make this a little pretty. And also add some comments. Now the final element to add is the bricks. Um, specifically like the bricks on the top so that we can break them. So let's just make some containers here first to see how it looks. I'm going to create some containers. And let's just see what this looks like. Cool, maybe let's make the corners a bit more round. For now, let's just concentrate on just one brick. And then after we've got one brick sorted, then we can just add multiple bricks. So I'm gonna keep track of the X coordinate of the brick and the width of the brick and the Y coordinate of the brick and the height of the brick. So we need these four elements. So media query is going to give us the height of the entire screen and then let's multiply it by the proportion that we want. Okay, now that brick looks pretty good, looks pretty fat. Let's make it a bit thinner. And the corners can be a little bit more sharper. And of course, now that now that we've got the basic look down, let's create a new file and encapsulate all of our code into the brick.dart file and copy and paste. So let's pass through those two red squiggles. So the height and the width, and create the constructors. We also, of course, need the X and Y intercept, which we forgot. And now we can come here and import it through. So now that the brick appearance wise looks looks good. Uh, let's make it work functionally. So we're going to check if the brick is dead or broken rather. So how are we going to do this? Well, let's we're going to have to keep track of another boolean, so a true or false value for brick broken. And we're going to pass that through to our brick file as well. 
And so if the brick is broken, then we can just say, well, if it is broken, then display an empty container. So we have this very we have this boolean now, and so what we're going to check is uh, we're going to create another method called check for broken bricks. And so the brick is going to be broken if uh, very similar to how we sorted it out for the player. Making contact with a brick is first of all we need to check the x coordinate. So the x coordinate is to the right of brick x but it's also to the left of brick X plus the width of that brick, right? So these are the two uh, edges that I showed you earlier. And of course, check the Y coordinate as well. Cool. There we go. So once we hit it, it goes away. Now it looks like on the top, it's still bouncing off of the minus 0 0.9. So let's do something about that. Let's just make it minus one, which is the top of the screen. And the other thing which, which reminds me is we should change the direction after we make contact with a brick. Cool, and so yeah, as you can see that it made contact with the brick and then after the brick disappeared, it went past that position and hit the very top of the wall. Now the next thing that I wanna control is this ball is currently only moving up and down. So let's also think about moving side to side. So I'm gonna keep track of the increments that we're gonna move in the horizontal direction as well as the vertical direction. Which means now that we're thinking about two axes, ball direction is not enough as a variable. We need to split that up and consider ball x direction and ball y direction. So in our enum as well, let's add left and right to our direction list. And so in our move ball, you can see that 0 0.01, I currently fixed it there. And so we can now just replace that with ball x increment and ball y increment. Sweet, so now that we're moving not just vertically but also horizontally, we can we have this effect of sort of moving diagonally. Which brings us to the next issue. It looks like it's working pretty good, but it's bouncing off the screen. So let's make it stop that. So let's come to our update direction and we're gonna to have to update it when it hits any of these walls. So the first one that we have here is ball goes up when it hits the player. The next one is ball goes down when it hits the top of the screen and we're going to have a couple more which is the left and right walls so basically we wanted we wanted to bounce off of these walls so let's just check the x coordinate of the ball if i hit the right wall then change back to left if i hit the left wall then change the direction back to right so hopefully this gives us the effect that we want and there we go cool so the ball is just bouncing within these four bounds this little rectangle of a game Cool, so now that we have the basic mechanics of this game pretty much sorted, let's make it more realistic and add more bricks. So we only made it work with one set of values for, uh, for, for a brick. I was gonna have a list of values that represent the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, and also if the brick is currently broken or not. I'm gonna rename this brick X to be the first brick X and the first brick Y. Okay, and so just using that as a reference point, we're gonna add different values on so that we have a nice consistent row of bricks. So let's just quickly change some of these values again. One extra, one extra variable I'm going to add in is something called a brick gap, which is just a gap between the bricks. 
the next one across from it, I want to make it first brick plus the brick width plus a gap. And so hopefully we're going to have two bricks next to each other. There it is. Looks like there's no gap. Now what we need to do now is to design a way to implement these bricks so that we don't have to do any manual labor work and we can easily change the number of bricks according to however many, however many you want. So in other words, I want to set up the code in a way where you can easily change variables around and everything else will automatically adjust itself as opposed to you set up your code in a way where you change one thing and then it will screw up all the rest of the code. Uh, we don't want that to happen. So to do that, we're going to need just a little bit of math. So I'm just going to show you this real quick. So let's say, for example, I have these three bricks. To add some variables to these, so we already know the first brick X is at that position. We also have a gap between the bricks, which we want to leave constant. And there's also a wall gap. So the distance between the brick and the, and the wall. And it should be the same on either side. And the last thing we also have is the dimension of the bricks itself, so the width. So what I want is I want a way to link all of these together. So one thing I know is if I add everything on the screen from left to right, we have two wall gaps. We have three bricks, but I'm going to say we have n bricks and plus n minus one lots of the gap. So if you think about it, those green gaps, we, you should always have one less gap than the total number of bricks. And this whole alignment situation, we talked about how negative one is on the left and positive one is on the right. So this whole distance is going to be two. So this is an important equation that just links up all of our variables together so that any change in one of the, in one of these variables will just automatically change the other. Now we just need one more crucial bit of information here, which is the starting point. So the first brick X, which is the X coordinate of the first brick, it should be negative one plus the wall gap. So, so in other words, from the left hand side of the wall represented by negative one, we're going to add the wall gap. And so whatever that point is, that's where we're going to position the first brick. So this way, with this bit of math, we can make it so that no matter what we choose for uh, N, we can automatically space these guys out, space these bricks out uh, really evenly and make it and make it equidistant from each side of the screen. And so it's important to note that all we need to figure out where we should place our first brick is we just need a wall gap. We just need to know what that value is. And so we're going to use our first equation to figure out what wall gap is. So I'm going to try to make wall gap the uh, subject and just do a little bit of algebra here. And last thing is just divide everything by two. So let's have a half out the front. Cool, so now that we have wall gap as the subject, what this means is, uh, what this means is we can control whatever we want on the right hand side of this equation. So N, meaning the number of bricks, the brick width and the brick gap. Uh, we can just insert any number we want for that and then it'll automatically figure out and calculate what the wall gap is and in turn figure out where we should place our first brick in order to make this all nicely placed. Cool, so if we come back to our code, what does it actually look like? So we figured out the fact that the first brick X is minus one plus wall gap, which means we're gonna have to create this wall gap variable. And wall gap, which is that big equation we figured out, it's half times that whole expression that we wrote out earlier. And for N, and to be more precise, we mean the number of bricks in each row. And so I'm going to say four and replace the ends with number of bricks. And so all of these values we can change. So I can change four back to two. And it looks like the gap situation is still not quite working. And I know why, because we have to, because we have to move the alignment properly like we did for the, for the player. So in our list of bricks, we can we can just add as many bricks as we want now. And the important thing to do is to make sure you constantly increment the, the width and the gap so that it's spaced out nicely. So we can create our third brick now. And yep, look, and you can see that it's all positioned nicely. Now, if you come back to our check for broken bricks code, right now we're only checking, we were only checking for one brick. Uh, but now that we have multiple bricks, Let's just copy this code and just place it in, an, in a for loop. 
and change those to eyes. So hopefully it should still hopefully it should still break the brick and it does but you can see what the next issue is. You can see what the next issue is is we break one brick and then all the bricks are broken and we obviously don't want that to happen. And the the reason why it's doing that currently is because right now we only have one variable brick broken and that's what we were checking. So now that we have this boolean for each brick in the list as you can see they're all false. That's the second, that's the number two. So now each brick should have its own boolean. There it is. Okay, pretty happy with that. Which brings us to finally one of the last things that we need to do in terms of the functionality of the game. And that is when we hit the brick, currently it changes the direction to come back down so that it feels like we are bouncing off that brick, which is good but we also want to check for all four sides of the brick. So for example, if I hit the side of the brick, I want to bounce off the side of it. And if I bounce off the top of the brick, then I want to bounce off the top. So we're going to have to consider the direction for the four situations. So each side of the brick. And so to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to just calculate the distance of the ball from each of the four sides upon contact. And the smallest distance should be the side that the ball hit. hit. So I'm going to create four doubles. So the first one I'm going to call left side distance. And basically I'm just going to check the distance between the current bricks X coordinate and the X coordinate of the ball. And we're going to absolute value it because I'm just interested in the distance. For the right distance, it's the same, it's the same code except for we're going to add a brick width to it since it's the right side of the brick. And similar to the top side and the bottom side. So now that we know the distance, of the ball to each side, we want to somehow find a way to figure out what's the smallest side. So I would like to have a method that just finds the minimum for me. So if I give it the left side, the right side, the top side and the bottom side, I want it to return and tell me which side was the smallest one. So we haven't actually created this method yet, but we'll do that later on after we figure out this plan. And so once this method returns to us what the smallest is, if the smallest is left, then change the direction to be left, and likewise for all the other four sides. And we don't really need a default. So this find min method, we didn't create it, so let's create it real quick now. I'm going to input uh, four doubles, and I'm going to return a string. So basically this just tells me which side is the smallest. And with this particular algorithm, I'm just going to copy this in and explain how I did it. So with four given numbers, I'm just going to put them in a list. So I'm going to say that the current minimum is just the first number. And we're going to do a for loop and just check that number against each element in the list. And if the number is less than the current minimum that we have, then that number is the new current minimum. So it's a pretty simple algorithm there. And so now this is going to spit back to us left, right, up or down and tells us which side is the smallest one. And so this is very useful to set the direction of the ball. So let's see how this looks. Now it looks like we don't really hit any of the bricks on the side, so let's change these x increments a bit. Let's make the x increment 2, which will make it more to the side. There we go. Okay, now the behavior was a bit funny there. It just moved sideways. Oh, and that's because I didn't check the X. Everything was just Y coordinate. Cool, so now it should work. Hey, so you can see how it like bounced. It hit, so you can see how it hit the side of the brick and then so it bounced off of it. And that's what we want. So once we show the game over screen, we also want to display a button to play the game again. And wrap that text in a stack so that we can position some, some other things in there. And what we need is a gesture detector specifically because we want to be able to tap. And so once you tap this button, then I want to perform a certain function. So let's make a pretty button real quick. And looks like we need some padding. 
and we're just going to decorate this the game up a bit so i want you to go to your pubspec yaml and import these two packages for me one's for a font and the other one is for uh, an avatar glow which i'll show you in a second So once you've imported those packages in, then I want you to copy in this bit of code. And so this is a font I got from Google, which you can also access easily. And specifically, I found this font called Press Start 2P, which gives a feel of a very like game kind of retro arcade type vibe. So I think it's kind of suitable for this game. And so that's the font. And for the ball, I'm going to copy this code in but it's basically the same code. And all I did is um, just depending on if the game has started or not, if it hasn't started yet, I'm going to show this uh, avatar glow. And so basically I just wrapped the ball in this avatar package that we imported. It has a nice uh, glowing effect as you can see there. So it makes it kind of inviting for the user to, to tap on the ball. Now the game ever looks very spaced out, but you can see that the font uh, I was going for and the last method we need is this reset game method. So this one basically just resets everything back to its initial value so that we can start the game again. So in here, we want to set the state and reset back to initial values. So the bricks, we want to change back to initial values and the X coordinates and Y coordinates uh, for the ball and the player as well. And of course, we should also check the Boolean back to normal. So is the game over, is back to false and game has not started. Cool, and this reset game is going to get triggered for when that button is pressed. So there's that function we coded in earlier. And so if we die, game over, we hit play again, and we can start the game back from the beginning. Perfect. Cool, so it looks, looks like it's working very well. Now let's just add some finishing touches to it. So for the cover screen, I also want to add that font in. And let's say Brick Breaker. I think this game had another name for it, like Arkanoid or something like that. But I don't know. I think Brick Breaker, people will get the idea of what that is pretty easily. So let's see how this looks. So at the beginning, before the game starts, we want to show, okay, the title. Also tap to play. I want to do something cool where... Uh, once the game has started, then the brick breaker, like the text, is going to be the, the color of it's going to be much lighter, so that it kind of um, kind of looks nice when you play the game. And finally, we want to not display that once the game is over. So, if the game over, if it is, then show nothing. Cool. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Hopefully you guys learned something and enjoyed it. I'm going to try to uh, be more consistent in my production. I'm going to try and aim for at least one video a week. So wish me luck and I'll see you guys in the next one.